Hello, I'm David Scheinbaum from Scheinbaum and Russick. Thank you for joining us again today. Today I'm going to continue our exploration into some photography books. Um, I think last week we called the video 10 Essential Books and I think today we'll just call this another 10. Although don't count them because there might be 11 or 12. In any case, I also want to say something that uh, means a lot to me. Uh, we got an incredible response last week from the 10 books I presented um, in the video. And after I realized, I guess in a way surprisingly but not surprisingly, that except for my talking at length about Nancy Newhall, Newhall and her contribution to photographic literature and, and writing in general, that all of the books I mentioned were, well, one is they were all historical, but they were all what we could politely say kind of older white guys. And, you know, it, on one hand it's not a surprise to me, I'm, I'm an old white guy myself, and those were the books that had a great influence on, on my life, um, especially my life in photography. But it's no longer acceptable. Um, it's not acceptable to me, and I don't think it should be acceptable to you to, um, to do that, actually. And of course there's thousands of books on, with, by, on people of color, um, uh, Women, of course, uh, you know, is a whole long thing. It's, it's, uh, it was shocking to me, and, and I, felt, I felt funny about it. So, I want to try to, you know, bring some other books forward to you today. We're calling this another 10. But um, I also want to stress that the books I'm selecting, for the most part, are not monographs as well. They're, they're books that are meant to be read. There are books that are driven by text, and you know it's in those texts and the way that text is written that also has all to do not only with the subject and the education and the scholarship about the photographer, about the subject, or about the period, but they also have all to do with how we approach our culture and whether it's kind of egalitarian, and, and I think these, these are important issues. Uh, we had more response to that video last week than most. Um, you sent so many comments and I appreciate it and I also kind of surprised no one kind of called me on on that. Um, and I guess I thank you for that in a way because I think I would have been maybe more disturbed if somebody, but I've been waiting all week to get a video from someone that said how come you only talked about men. Um, but you didn't. I thank you, but um, let, me add, let me add to that list from last week. And I want to start with uh, kind of a, a sad note. Um, you know, I talked about Beaumont as kind of the consummate photo historian, but another great photo historian is uh, Naomi Rosenblum. Um, she passed this week at age of 96, so um, all the more reason to remind you of, of her and her life's work. She also wrote a history of photography. It's, it's kind of a, I want to say it's kind of a picture history, but there is another book by a man named Pollock who did a picture history of photography. But what's interesting about this um, history of photography is that it's, it talks about the periods of photography, it talks about all various photographers, but it also covers all of the technical aspects of photography. And I think when I was talking about Beaumont's book, Last week I said he was the first person to kind of put photography in an art historical context and there were some books before his on the technical history. This book by Naomi Rosenblum is actually both. It has a, a very in-depth technical history of the inventions, the inventors. It goes into details with diagrams about all of the various um, early processes of photography. But it also, of course, covers all of the people and, and all of the topics. But this is not the book I'm really talking about today. It's this other book that she wrote, which um, it's on the history of women in photography. So if we're talking about essential books for your bookshelf, this is one that I think certainly needs to be included. 
And this, in a way, um, maybe talks about everything I didn't talk about last week. It really covers uh, many of the women practitioners in photography from the earliest beginnings, and actually I'm going to talk a little more about one or two of those practitioners today. But, and it also comes up in, into kind of contemporary photography. And so this is a book I would recommend you get. Um, it's, as I said, the history of women in photography. Uh, I should, I guess, say at this moment that some of the books I'm going to show you today can be quite costly. I don't think you should be running out and getting them. And some of them, as I said last week, there's different editions. You might want to look for them, but anyway, this um, certainly the Rosa Bloom books are easily um, um, accessible and they're also well priced. This is a pretty kind of an unassuming book on a very important subject. Um, this book is about the FSA. Now there's, like a lot of topics, there's many books on the FSA, but for some reason this, is, this book is the one I've always used myself. I have found in incredibly informative. The text is concise. It's clear, you know, if we're thinking of this period of photography in the 30s, um, Roy Stryker and his team of photographers who basically chronicled, um, documented the, the Dust Bowl, kind of the move from the, from the East to the West. And maybe if you're not familiar with the Farm Security Administration and those photographers who worked under Roy Stryker, Think of the Beverly Hillbillies. I don't, that doesn't demean the subject, but you know, basically these are people who packed everything up on, on their backs or on the back of their car and they, they headed west to seek a better life, to seek their fortune. This, uh, the photographs from this project, the FSA project, included the work of Dorothea Lang, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this migrant mother image, the work of Marion Post Walcott, but also Walker Evans, Ben Sean, Russell Lee, um, John Collier Jr., many photographers who were assembled by Stryker to give us a, what he called, what this book is called, A Portrait of a Decade. So again, there's many books on the FSA. This is just one that I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I, I like, I'm attracted to. Another kind of a more historical book is this book, called Seeing Straight. And this is a book that it was uh, published by the Oakland Museum. Um, they have a great archive, including the work of many of the photographers that were part of Group F64. Um, Group F64 was a very important, very short-lived, but a very short, um, important, very influential group of photographers that um, promoted what they called straight photography on the West Coast. And straight photography, kind of as defined, was um, in opposition to what we might call pictorial photography, um, which was mostly being practiced on the East Coast, um, in the group around Alfred Stieglitz, the pictorialists, the photo secessionists, people who were making uh, very soft focus, very romantic pictures, this is a group of photographers, uh, Edward Weston, Ansel Adams, but Sonia Noskoviak, Consuela Kanaga, Imogen Cunningham, uh, many photographers who wanted to promote photography that looked like photography. They, of course, felt that the camera is capable of photographing is sharper than the human eye, crisp, bright contrast, printing on glossy paper, bright imagery. This was straight photography, un un altered photography, mostly contact prints. So this is a great uh, text on the group, on the importance of the group, has a nice introduction by Beaumont Newhall, and it includes many of the kind of masters of straight photography in the 20th century. There you go. Another book would be this Alfred Stieglitz book. Now this is very expensive I don't know that it's been reprinted, but I think a lot of the information might be online. But this is a catalog resume that was um, really kind of put together by Sarah Greeno, the photography curator at the National Gallery, 
This is the catalog resume of all of the works of Alfred Stieglitz. So, you know, I don't think I need to talk about the importance of Alfred Stieglitz. I think many of you know who he is. This contains basically all of his work. It has notations on his work, approximately how many prints were made of each of those works, um, all the critical information about the size of the prints, where they were made, how they were made, how they were mounted, how, if they were signed, if they weren't signed, what museums hold these works. This is certainly for someone like me with a library that's not just the library of a photographer, but as a dealer, we're always doing research about works. You know, this is a two-volume set that I'm always looking when we establish what we might call provenance, when we want to know more about a particular image. In terms of Alfred Stieglitz, the answer to all the questions I might have are in these books. But again, I think these books are quite costly now, but I also think this information is online or in the process of being put online. Now, those kind of, that's like my little history section. In terms of some other photographers, and again, these are books that I have, for the most part, all the people I'm going to talk about now, these are not the only books about them or by them. So, you know, if you're interested in the work, you know, I'm sure you could find other volumes. One of the earliest women photographers was Anna Atkins. Anna Atkins was a cyanotypist. Um, you know, some people would consider her the first woman photographer, and some historians, there are some other names that come to mind about who was the first woman photographer. But she was a friend of uh, Sir John Herschel, a name you might not know, or you might know, who was not a photographer. He was uh, a very learned person, very incredibly, um, he's a genius. He was an astronomer, he was a mathematician, he was... He, he was a great thinker, a great philosopher, but he invented cyanotypes not for photography purposes, but in a way that maybe you or, or I have used a copy machine or a Xerox machine. He was looking for a way to copy his notes, his, his sheaves of paper, so he invented cyanotype, and he was basically printing copies of his written pages. But he was also the man who William Henry Fox Talbot went to when he couldn't figure out a proper way to fix the photographic image. Um, Herschel just gave him the answer. So Herschel had a lot to do with the formative years of photography. He had relationships with a lot of early photographers. And kind of the first artist to pick up on his cyanotype invention was Anna Atkins, who was interested in botany and she used the process to catalog various uh, plants, various algae, moss, and, and leaf studies, and everything being labeled. These are some awesome cyanotypes. Great story um, of how she came about um, making these images. And then I put this other book. This is actually a children's book that just came out. Um, in the last year or two, and it's called The Bluest of Blues, and it's, it's about the work of Anna Atkins, but it's a children's book. So if you have children or a public school nearby where you might go in and talk about photography with the kids, you know, making sun prints or doing this is very, very simple. You could be doing this with children. It's just putting prints on blueprint paper and mixing up the chemistry, developing them in water, running out in the sun. It's a lot of fun. And this is a great little children's book on the process and a little history of Anna Atkins. Speaking of Herschel and speaking of early women photographers, maybe one of the most important photographers in terms of portraiture, I feel, would be Julia Margaret Cameron. She too was an associate, a friend of Sir John Herschel. Her photography, um, was a great interest of hers. Um, I think she produced some of the best, most expressive portraits in, in photography. Although these were made in the 19th century, I think people have yet to rival some of the imagery that she made in terms of their, their emotional power, their sheer beauty and impact when you look at these images. 
She was criticized a lot for her work by the men of the period. Um, a lot of her work we would call soft focus. And she was criticized, people who would say, oh, she didn't even know how to focus the camera. But the truth is, she was very aware of what she was doing. I'll just pick out one image. She was very aware of her process, very aware of what she was doing. And her portraiture, as I said, I feel is unrivaled. Very important photographer. These are just two books about her and her work. This is actually a whole album she did about the Victorian album or her circle. This is a kind of a more of a monographic type book. But if you don't have a book in your library that includes the work of Julia Margaret Cameron, I think that would be a great omission. And you know, between Anna Atkins and between Julie Margaret Cameron and between what I just said about William Henry Fox Talbot, the in, one of the inventors of photography, you might want to include a look into John Herschel, or Sir John Herschel, if you're not familiar with him, his work, his genius, and his relationship to the early formative years of photography. Laura Gilpin Certainly those of us in the Southwest are very aware of her, but you know, when Janet and I and Andra go to New York every year and we include Laura Gilpin's work in our booth, I'm always surprised. I, I kind of meet too many people who are not familiar with her work. Um, Laura was, is one of the masters, the great masters of 20th century photography. Um, she's a very important artist. Her work is a, a great contribution to the history of photography. As a young woman, she studied uh, at the Clarence White School in New York, so she was trained kind of as a pictorialist. But when she came back to the Southwest, which was her home, she started to photograph the environs, and ultimately she produced this book, which is just one of her books, called The Enduring Navajo. Um, you know, for someone who spans, you know, pictorialism to straight photography, to, in a sense, documentary photography. You know, she, she did it all. And this book is not only, it does not only include um, these intimate portraits of the Navajo people, because she had a special access. Um, her partner, who was a nurse on the Navajo reservation, was able to introduce her to many families who welcomed her into their hogans into their farms, into these areas. So she had kind of an amazing access to photograph the Navajo people. But the text, which chronicles the customs and, and the explanations of their life and their building and their art forms, um, it's a very important book, The Enduring Navajo. And if you have more interest in Laura Gilpin, um, Martha Sandweiss, who at the time was the curator of the Eamon Carter Museum, which um, houses Laura Gilpin's archive, um, produced this kind of a more of a retrospective uh, book about Laura Gilpin. This too is kind of readily available online. It, it looks like it should be, you know, a thousand dollars, but it's not. It, it's a great uh, text, a great biography of Laura Gilpin, and it traces the kind of the highlights of, of her life's work. So I, I would actually recommend you having both of these books, but um, certainly please have The Enduring Navajo. And I already mentioned Imogen Cunningham, many books of her work. This is just one. This is a, from a, kind of a collection. It was edited by a, a great collector, a man named Manfred Hiding. But this uh, kind of also covers, you know, more of a retrospective look at Imogen's work. But Imogen, who kind of early, an early member of Group F64, and then of course a great photographer in her own right. I mean, if you ever read or seen videos of Ansel Adams talk or Walt or um, Willard Van Dyke talking about Imogen, she she was a feminist really early, and she kept those men kind of on point, and she didn't let them get away with anything in terms of their subject matter, in terms of how they approached uh, photographing women, in terms of what they said, <laughs> and she really um, was outspoken, an amazing person, and an amazing photographer. To, the more you know about her and her work, it's incredibly inspiring, 
and the work is, is extraordinary. So again, maybe not this particular book, but you, you need to have books about Imogen Cunningham. Getting closer to home, it's interesting. I mentioned Naomi Rosenblum. Well, both Janet and I uh, studied photography at Brooklyn College, and one of our teachers was Walter Rosenblum, who was Naomi Rosenblum's husband. And the other photography teacher at Brooklyn College was a man named Barney Cole. And the two of them were basically former secretary and treasurer of the Photo League. And if you don't know about the Photo League, you should get a book about the Photo League, which actually I didn't include today. But having um, them as teachers, and of course, you know, Naomi Rosenblum kind of lived the photographic life, you know, because that, that indeed was what was going on, and she brought a lot of scholarship to it. But both uh, Walter Rosenblum and Barney Cole, they, they were teachers, they were educators. But studying with them, um, they would bring friends to class. And when I was studying at Brooklyn College, um, and actually my first critiques that I ever had as a student were by a man who was teaching photography at Hunter College, another college in New York, and that was Roy de Carava. And although Roy de Carava was kind of my critiquer for a time, I can't consider him my teacher, um, he, to me, really um, had a great influence on me personally and my work. This little book maybe is one of the most important books in, in this whole library. It's the work of Roy de Carava and the text by Langston Hughes. This was done, the original edition of this book was in 1955. It's basically a chronicle of life in Harlem at the time. You know, everything from, as Langston Hughes wrote in here, is waking up every day and knowing it's probably going to be the same as yesterday. And that life in Harlem and the hardships that they faced. But then, the incredible sensitivity and beauty that Roy de Carava captured in his community. It's, it's all in, in this book and, you know, as much as we like to talk about great photographic reproduction and this and that, you know, once you open this book, none of that matters. You, the, the, regardless of how the images are reproduced, you're riveted by these incredibly fantastic, straightforward photographs and the beautiful text by Langston Hughes. This, um, there are new editions of this that are not incredibly costly. You don't need a first edition. And it's probably, the later editions probably have better reproduction than these early editions. But the, this book, Sweet Fly, Paper of Life, is an essential book. You must, this is one of those you have to have in, in your library. But of course, there's many books by Roy de Carava. This was a catalog for exhibition that was at the Museum of Modern Art some years ago. This has a great selection of his work, and it also has a great text. Um, you know, one of the things about Roy de Carava, and actually one of the reasons to have at least one book that has great photographic reproduction, which unfortunately this flypaper book doesn't, is his printing style. Um, Roy de Carava had a way of printing a, what we might call the low end. He printed black on black on black, but detail everywhere. I mean, I don't know, I, I, it's hard to just hold up a book, but um, to be able to see a well-reproduced Roy de Carava photograph to a photographer is, uh, is almost a, the grail. To see someone printing on that low end, so dark, but holding the, the detail within the shadow, within the shadow, within the shadow, it's a thrill. So, you know, I'll go to a museum when COVID's over and get to look at some original prints, but in the meantime, look at his work. This book is maybe, for me as a photographer, maybe one of the most important books, or maybe I've said that about others too, I don't know. But um, some of you know, in my own photography work, I photograph a lot of hip hop artists, and I have been doing that for the last 20 years. My inspiration, actually it's here, my inspiration for my hip-hop work and, um, is actually both Julie Margaret Cameron 
in terms of, of how I approach the heads of the artist I photograph, but this book, this Roy de Caraba book, which has, the, I think, the most wonderful title of any book on this table, it's called The Sound I Saw. It's amazing, The Sound I Saw, and it's a book about jazz, um, basically New York, but his photographs of music and the musicians really capture the sound. And when I started photographing hip-hop, that's when I really started to understand what this book was about. But this was my go-to reference. I come back from shows, look at my work, and look through this book, go back to the next show and try to do it again and again and again. Um, this is, a, a, for me, a very inspiring book. For those of you who, who photograph live uh, events, live music especially, um, people, you want this book, The Sound I Saw. Now speaking of Roy De Carava and hip-hop, and, and before I even say this, I should say, one of the comments a lot of you wrote last week was, can I talk about more contemporary people? Because <laughs> I guess a lot of the books, uh, certainly last week I talked about, were all historical. So within that vein, and thinking about some contemporary photographers, and speaking about hip-hop, you know, hip-hop music um, is the voice, you know, for the underserved. You know, it's the voice of the inner city, but it's also the voice of people who don't have a voice. And actually, I'm going to talk about two photographers who basically give voice to a, a culture, a situation, um, a, a, an area, and photography is great for that. I think maybe one of the most important photographers working today, period, is Carrie Mae Weems. Carrie Mae Weems is giving voice to so many important topics within our contemporary culture, within our American history. And by photographing and putting an image, you know, illustrating so many of the ills within our culture, within the ills of our society, not only how we treat each, each other, but how we, we treat class, race. Um, that's what she does, and she does it in the most elegant way. These are just two of her books. Um, she uh, received a, um, a MacArthur Fellowship a few years back, so there's been a, a flurry of publications and exhibitions of her work. So many books have come out in the last four or five years. I implore you, you must have books by Carrie Mae Weems within your library. We just received one yesterday in the mail that we purchased. There's a, a small um, press called Nasrelli Press who does very small runs, who just published a book on Carrie Mae Weems. I haven't even opened it yet, but you know, Janet and I, we bought a copy immediately as soon as we saw it advertised. Um, I don't know when you're going to be looking at this video, it might already be gone, but Please, look at the work of Carrie Mae Weems, look at, she's basically, to me, her photography is, is what hip-hop music is, as I said, and it, it's, it's visual hip-hop. Everything that hip-hop is covering, um, she's kind of addressing in, in terms of bringing it forward, creating a dialogue, um, bringing up subjects that, you know, have been left to the kitchen table, um, bringing them out in the open and, and, you know, encouraging dialogue. Another photographer that's giving voice to those without is the photographer Sebastio Salgado. Sebastio is an amazing photographer, an amazing man. He's artistically, he's in the footsteps of Henri Cartier-Bresson, street photographer, small format, 35 millimeter. But he's photographing in places in the world, he's photographing peoples of the world who, you know, you know, when I lecture about him, we say, you know, we read about things on, on the newspaper every day, but then we, we put the newspaper down and we go about our business. We finish eating our bagel or our croissant and, and you know, we go to work. Sebastian Salgado, is, he's photographing the voiceless, he's giving voice to subjects, to people who, who we 
we want to ignore, basically. He grabs us by our shirt collar and he shakes us up. He insists that we pay attention to what's going on. Some of his images, you know, I'd swear they're almost biblical in nature. Um, laborers all around the world who are still working with primitive tools, doing hand labor, whether they're miners or builders. Um, Sebastio has brought so much to our attention in, in the last 20 years. Um, this is an early book of his called An Uncertain Grace, which um, has a great text, has a great essay in it by Eduardo Galliano um, and Fred Richin. But, you know, this is kind of a good overview, but he's been working on these monumental projects. I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with him. You know, this is a book on workers. This is a book on migrations. You know, he spends years on a topic he travels the world, he photographs, he, he's not a casual photographer, he lives with his subject, he stays there, he, he's trained as an economist, he, he's important to him to know the circumstances, to know the language, to know the politics, why is this happening, what caused this to happen, how are the people dealing with it, why is this suffering going on, and what could he do about it. And this is what he could do about it. He makes these images, he mounts these gigantic exhibitions, and he brings these things to our attention. Um, you, he cannot be ignored. Um, he has a great sentence, which I quote a lot, his notion of that photographs are given and not taken. And that's really kind of his mantra. He, he's, he endears himself to his subjects, he spends time with his subjects to the point that they open up to his camera. And he's not working with some long lens hiding behind trees, you know, snapping pictures. He's involved, and he stays involved, um, even well after these books are gone. And today's bonus book is this, kind of it's dated, but it's not dated. And those of you who are photo collectors, you know, this is a, a, an important, you must have it. It's, I don't even know when it was done. I think it was done in the 80s. Um, yeah, 1980. That's his second print, but the first edition in 1979. Uh, an early important photography dealer was a man named Lee Whitkin. And this was called the Photographer's Collector's Guide. And early on, before the internet, before we could Google everything, this not only has biographies of hundreds of important photographers, I mean, I just turned to Laura Gilpin's page, but so it not only has information about the photographer, it has what books, has bibliography, it has if they ever produced limited edition portfolios, it has examples of their signatures, and if their signatures changed over their lifetime, it has examples of all those signatures, it has um, copies of the stamps that they used on the back of their prints. So we, I use this book all the time when I receive a print into inventory and I need to research it, now, again, this book's been out of print for years. Um, there's been a number of attempts to kind of update it, and it's just, it's never been done. But even though it's, it's dated on one hand, I, I'm going to guess um, many of the photographers in your collection, if you want to find out some more details about the print you have, or was it from a portfolio, or it was from an exhibition print, this is a kind of a great reference book. So. I would say, you know, you should have this book. Um, they come in soft cover as well, and you know, you know, it's kind of been discovered. A lot of collectors are always looking for it. I think, I don't know how much it would cost now, but um, again, if you have a collection that includes the work of 20th century photographers, um, you should have it. If you want to know more about digital and things like that, that's not in this book. It's not, it does not up to date. But it's, it's a great resource. So that's it for today. I, I hope I answered some of your questions. Um, please go to our website, uh, photographydealers.com. You'll see all of our blogs every week. You'll see other videos. Um, and again, from your response, um, I, that's, that's what made us you know, decide to produce another version. So we'll call this you know, another 10. And, um, and good luck with your collecting and good luck building your photographic library. Ciao.